I am Gretchen Huseman. My topic is problem solving in the classroom, and we are in room 27, correct? All right. So, welcome everyone. I'm excited to be here today with you to talk about education and give you some tools, practical, tried, and true tools for the classroom. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, but before we do, I would like to pray for you. I would also like to pray for your schools, and I especially want to pray for this classroom and this school because they have obviously taught these children hospitality, service, and I am just so grateful for them. And you see it in their faces. The little gal who helped me get started today, she's beautiful. So um, i just so grateful. So let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for... Your loving provision for our um, teachers who are here today and educators and parents or administrators or whoever is present, Lord, thank you for their presence. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the schools we represent here. Thank you for those ministries. I thank you for your enduring love that is helping us endure during these days of being a teacher. I pray, Lord, that you would bless what they are doing that you would equip them today, you would fill their cups as they go back on Monday if they have school, on Tuesday if they don't. I pray for this school, Lord. Thank you for what's happening at this place. Thank you for the ministry here. I thank you for this teacher, this second grade room, Lord, and for every child whose seat we are sitting in whose boards we're looking at, names we're seeing today. I pray your blessing on them. I pray for um, your grace to be among them and that you would continue to do a great work here in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am currently teaching four-year-old preschool in Pensacola, Florida. Um, our little school is called Amazing Grace Preschool. I had no intention of teaching. That's a day or and a story for another time. Um, in August, I quick got Florida ready because, as you know, if you've moved from state to state, doesn't matter how long you've taught, there's always some little class you have to take at the very last minute. And I started out the school year with one week of school, and then I went to Europe with my husband for three weeks. Who does that? It was a vacation we had planned. I had not intended to teach, but um, the Lord didn't call me into the classroom. He opened the door and went, there you go. That's how I started teaching again this year. This is my eighth school. I have taught in seven states across the country over the last <clears throat> 30 b -b -b years. <laughs> I'm a Concordia Chicago graduate, and... Um, Mostly have taught four-year-olds, but I have substituted in with infants to high school, all levels, because um, that's what I do in between those moves and having children. I've substituted all levels, so um, I really do love all age groups. Four-year-olds have been a favorite. However, my bones are getting tired, and so uh, every time I think I'm going to leave a classroom and retire, um, I, someday I'm going to make it permanently. It's going to be a permanent uh, move. In the meantime, um, I love to equip and encourage teachers and administrators. I love to speak to women's groups. I lead Bible studies, do all that kind of stuff. And I've raised four kids, my husband and I, um, three of which are teachers, and all of which are struggling in the classroom. And so I had just... Not just my own experiences and talking to all of you, I know firsthand how difficult these last few years have been. And so kudos to all of you who are still being in it. Um, I'm just going to tell you right now that at the end of this session, and it's been a little while since I've done this, been a minute since I've done this class, will it take us the whole 90 minutes? I don't think so. If you are willing, I would love for you to just hang with me for a minute after our Q&A. I have some questions for you. So if you hang out with me through this whole class and um, answer some questions with me, I have some gifts for you at the end. Um, however, I will say this also. If after you have heard me speak for a couple of minutes and you've decided this is not your 
cup of tea. This isn't what you thought. Please, you will not offend me. Go, 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 <laughs> go out and find a class that will help you today because I do realize that I'm coming from a younger kid perspective. I believe all these concepts that we're going to talk about today can be applied at any level. In fact, I know many adults who need to learn the problem solving strategies <laughs> that I'm going to share with you today. Um, but again, I won't be offended if you want to leave. Now, let me. Yes. Yes, you. please. So I had a substitute teacher yesterday. Okay. For seventh period, I called the teacher, and she said, "I don't know what is wrong with those people. Twenty-nine boys oh. out of thirty-two <gasps> in class. Oh, bless you. Eight of those are football players. <laughs> so she was totally like, I don't know how this was like. So I wrote an uh, email to this class. <laughs> problem solving. Problem solving. A, an apology note to Miss. Uh, oh. Oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. All right. I want to know you a little bit. So can we take a minute just to, um, uh, let's see. Teachers, raise your hand if you're a teacher. All right. Most of you. Any administrators? Uh, what am I missing? DCEs? Here for parents? Um, pastors. pastors? Yep. <laughs> pastors, good. Um Level, teacher levels, okay, or where are my early childhood peeps? Awesome. Elementary, good. High school, even? Ooh, good, okay, high school. Mm. I, have, I have created a, a boundary. I will not substitute boys PE <laughs> anymore. I'm sorry, I just can't, I can't. <laughs> And junior high then, uh, then my boundary expanded. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I'm getting too old for this. So I am elementary sub anymore. It is, oh, they need to be triple paid. Okay, let's get started. Um, show of hands, how many of you can fix a car? Oh, that is awesome. And so if my broken down 2016 Touring, Volkswagen Touring broke down. Could I, could I bring it to you and would you fix it for me? <laughs> Not a Volkswagen. <laughs> a little bit? Well, what if I actually gave you the, a couple of tools? Here, I know this, this part. My husband literally just ordered a part and it's at our door. Well, hopefully our neighbor grabbed it. Couldn't you, if I, I know this goes to it, would you do it? What if I... What if I encouraged you? I know you can do this. Here's a couple tools. I know you can just try. No? You wouldn't, try, wouldn't take a part? What if I insisted you need to do this? Please fix my car. No. Why not? Why not? What? You make it work. Okay. What are you lacking? Skills. Skills? Knowledge. What else? Knowledge. Knowledge. <laughs> Patience. <laughs> well, uh, training comes with skills. We're missing one more. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Strength. Okay. Skills, knowledge, tools. There are special tools. My husband's a car guy. And I just told him, you're scaring me. Because every time we get another car, he orders new tools. And then we sell that car, and now we got all these tools. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not sure I'm keeping the Volkswagen. True story. <laughs> so you need knowledge, skills, and tools. And no matter how much I beg, plead, or coerce you, you are not going to be able to fix my car. And yet, this is what we expect sometimes of our kiddos as they um, learn to problem solve. So keep that in mind. Hello. Okay, hang on. I'm going to be real transparent here for a minute. Um, I don't like conflict at all. Any other peacemakers in the room? Yeah, I am that peacemaker who did not um, ever really uh, talk back to my mother. Um, and so I was a peacemaker as a young child and as a mom, very, very much a peacemaker. I avoided conflict at all costs at home in, as a little girl, as a teacher, and as a mom especially. And taking it one more step um, and sharing my vulnerability. If anybody of you went to that great talk in the church yesterday morning, they, she talked about the difference of being transparent and vulnerable. I can tell you with all honesty, 
I was not good at problem solving because I hated problems. But now I regret so much because my children did not learn these skills when they were young and they don't really speak to each other. I have four kids, three of them are teachers and they live all over the country and they never worked out the problems that they had. I learned these skills later in my career and they are so important, that's why I brought them to you today. I did not know that every conflict is an opportunity to engage in problem solving. I did not know these were life skills as important as learning to pray and read your Bible and do the laundry and all those other life skills that we need because I just hated it and I didn't know how and so I didn't teach it. But it is a opportunity. How many of you in your classroom do what I used to do and make sure everyone had the same color? Right? And some of our licensing, if you're early childhood, you know that they even say that. You have to have five of that item to have it in that. Do any of you have that? You have to have five of this in order to, if you're going to have this, you have to have so many per child. Um, or, okay, let me give you this real life scenario. The cup cupcakes arrive, some are purple, some are pink. All right? Or you got chocolate and vanilla. What are you going to do? Are you going to you get what you get or you don't have a fit? Or are you like me? I would have easily, what would you do? What would you have done? What do you do now? This table's going to get all pink. This table's going to get all purple. I probably still would do that today, <laughs> honestly. Um, we, I had a scenario where uh, we had about five or six red bikes, and there was one pink one. And I remember after learning these strategies I'm going to share with you, my assistant, my new assistant said, oh, just leave the pink one in the closet. You know, it's pink. I'm like, yeah. And she said, well, we can't have the pink one out. They'll fight over it. I said, yeah. The old me would have said, keep the pink one in the closet. Now I look for the one pink one so we can set up an opportunity for learning. But before we can even begin teaching problem solving, we need to do a few things early in the school year. And, all right, for those of you who teach higher levels, I'm just going to say, I am a preschool teacher. <laughs> My graphics are preschool. Our, our, um, a lot of this teaching is going to begin in those early years, even as early as two. But it's not too late in first, second, third. And I think you can apply these concepts to any level, including adults. So. You just got to transpose my cutesy graphs here. The first thing we need to do at the beginning of the school year is get to know our students, obviously, right? We are getting to know their, the child, their family, how they run, how they don't run. I mean, when I say run, I don't mean run. I mean how they groove, okay? You'll use a few tools for that, like the, the questionnaire. Any of you do a questionnaire? You want to get to know your child. What do, they, what do they like? What do they dislike? What works? What doesn't? Okay, use that questionnaire to get to know their disposition, right? Open house is another opportunity just to start observing and watching. I mean, I know those are busy times, and I ask myself, is that even realistic to say? But I do remember some kids coming in, open house, I'm seeing their face for the first time, and the way they march in and take over a room will tell you something about their problem-solving skills or what you might be facing. Um, who still does home visits? Anyone? Anyone not know what a home visit is? Okay, so in the old days, we all did home visits. I'll tell you what, I did not do home visits this year because I didn't know I was teaching in August. But in my last school, uh, I did home visits. I had to tell my director what a home visit was. I wanted to really get to know these families. And it does take time, but that is the best place to see is when they're in their own environment. If you want to know about home, more about home visits, talk to me after. It's a great way to bring Jesus right into there. Anyway. Okay, and then the first few weeks, right? You're going to be looking, listening, watching how they work out issues. You're not talking much about other than please don't, you know, if they're kicking over the blocks, they're hitting each other. Of course you're going to intervene, but you're not going to be able to bring these strategies in quite yet. Because you're still watching how they groove and how they run. All right, so get to know your kids. And then, of course, you're going to establish your classroom rules. 
I've actually met a couple of teachers who didn't think this was necessary. <laughs> I don't know where they were trained, but it wasn't one of our Concordias. <laughs> So, of course, you want some rules. And the younger the kids you know, the fewer the rules, right? So in 4K, we have three rules. Be kind, be safe, be helpful, right? You want them to be clear. You want, I know there are different theories about whether you include the kids in creating the rules. You know what you want. You can lead them to that. Or you can do like I did coming in at the last minute. Here they are. You don't have any discussion over it. I have three rules. Be kind, be safe, be helpful. Because until they know what's expected, and this is part of the knowledge piece, you're not going to be able to work out social situations because they honestly do think it is okay to just knock over Joey's tower block, because, tower, um, block tower because that's fun. That's an invitation. And so we have to teach them. They do not know that. And so, of course, the expectations have to be there. And they need to be reviewed often. And I know even in the uh, older grades and in, in youth rooms, I've seen them in, on posters. They have to be visual, right? They have to be everywhere. I've even been in some schools where they wanted those simple, positively stated rules everywhere you go. So we had it in the classroom. We had it in our large motor area, which was our fellowship hall. We had that same sign with the same wording and the same pictures on the, uh, just at the door where we went outside. So we would review them going outside at least once a week. We're going outside. Tell me again. I gave them a few scenarios. I mean, we go on the slide. How are we going down the slide? Are we climbing up the slide? We going, you know, whatever. Whatever your, your guidelines are. Just a quick review. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Do we um, throw the ball over the fence? <laughs> you know? Do we um, take a ball from a friend? You know, is that being kind? You know, we're reviewing this and reviewing this all through September, all through October. Okay, getting those expectations clear in their minds, always in that positive way, of course. And then capture them doing the right thing. So take pictures of them. Here's my rules. So I don't know if you can see this very well, but here, um, being safe, one of the reasons we walk in a line is to be safe. So I have a picture of them walking in the line. Um, we're not climbing on the equipment. We're riding it. So I t captured that. And I have friends playing well with the toys, and now they're being helpful. They're picking up the toys. These are their pictures. So I took those probably mid-October and put them up there and reminded them. And yeah, here's another one from another school. They're a little bigger. These friends are sharing the ball. One boy, one ball, two boys. That doesn't happen very often. But I caught them, and I captured it in a picture. And those same, no, that's a different boy. They're going down the slide. So I posted it. We talk about it. You get, they get all sorts of kudos, right? And constantly, constantly reviewing and acknowledging and look at you doing the right thing. All right. So once you have gotten to know your kids, clear expectations, we got to talk about emotions, guys, in America, right? there's so much confusion, and I'm not going to go off into <laughs> political things, but there's so much confusion about what's real fear and what's anxiety and what's anger and what's, I mean, this is it, so important. It's why there's so many uh, sessions this week on even just mental health. We're not, we're not talking about this. We need to talk about this. The early childhood teachers know this. You guys know Teaching feelings, we'll do whole units on feelings, right? Early on in the, um, in the school year, we have to help our kids have the language, the verbiage to identify how they're feeling. And guess what, guys? We do too. We need to think about, why am I in this mood today? Am I really, um, am I really hungry or am I just thirsty, <laughs> for an ex example? Your brain can trick you. Did you know that? If you're dehydrated, sometimes you think you're hungry when really you just need water. <laughs> That's just a little side note. And even the very littles, the two-year-olds, are learning to identify faces, right? So maybe they're not saying the words yet, but they're looking at pictures, and you're using mirrors, and you're talking and helping them identify feeling. Help them label. You're looking at vocal cues from those littles. When they're born, they come out of the womb with those different cries, right? Then we get to preschool, kindergarten, primary, 
and we're teaching them the words, we're giving them the verbiage, we're giving them the labels. Think about it. Think how, how many angry kiddos you've had or they're having that temper tantrum. I have one. Oh, bless his heart. He's four, almost five, and he loves to just sit down when his tower's been knocked over and just cry like a two-year-old. And that's just his emotional level. <sighs> oh, darling Noah. <laughs> I just want to, you know, and, but I'm, he, he's come so far. He's learning. He's learning. This is not angry. This is sad. This is disappointment. Angry looking emotions can mean I haven't had enough to eat today. And some of ours that are coming from the local area, we are now partner with, it's a public and public school in a, in a parochial setting. I know some of those kids are coming hungry. And they may seem like they're in a really bad mood and fighty fighty when I think they haven't eaten for probably 12 hours. Um, lonely and sad can look like angry, right? But they're not, but they don't know that. And so they're acting out. That's why those feelings units are so important. And now more than ever, we got to revisit that a lot. So in January, we came back from Christmas. We did a whole week of feelings again, right? You, you got to get the charts up there and have the faces and talk about it. Um, do the, do the check-ins, right? This should probably come out once a month all through the school year. How are you feeling today? Can we change that? How can we change that? Later, I might go back and say, I know you were really sad when you first came in. How are you feeling now? They need to know they're, they've been heard. Uh, admins, you got to do this with your staff too, right? Checking in. How's it going? How are you doing? And we have to model this, right? And share our own feelings. Um, I am feeling very sad today. Whatever. Now, be careful not to overuse this one. I've seen this turn into a little passive aggressive. Have you ever heard, that it just makes me sad? Have you heard that in the classroom? That really makes me sad when you do that. So now we have confused it for them. We have used our angry voice and our angry face. We're told don't use those negative words, so we're, 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 we're hesitating saying I'm angry at you right now, okay? Because that's intimidating to children. So we've replaced it with sad. So be careful of that. I've fallen into that. I have done that. Where I'm like, ooh, that makes me really sad. And now I have confused them because I look angry and sound angry. And I'm not really sad, I'll be honest. You just made me mad. So I'm not, I got to find another way of doing that. We need to re, re, remember not to confuse our language too. Right? All right. So post the charts. Use the check-in. Help them identify their feelings. Fourth, you're going to teach them calming strategies. And this is kind of all happening at the same time, right? These are prerequisites. You're going to teach them how to calm down those angry feelings. And boy, is this important at all levels, even for us. <sighs> Let's take a deep breath. This has to be modeled. Anytime you get the opportunity after PE, we've just come in from outside. Those are great things, right? But there's a lot of energy in that. Even if they're 13, there's a lot of energy. So let's model. Let's do some breathing exercises. If you've never done that, get, find some resources. Grab some. I don't know how you feel about yoga, but there's a lot of good pieces from yoga that you can pull from about calming, stretching. Anybody do kids yoga with their class? Yeah. It, it can be very, very effective. And it doesn't have to be time consuming. I'm looking for a couple of my resources here. Here's a couple things that I found to help regulate teaching, obviously, books, okay, to help self-regulate. Um, there are a lot of good resources. Here's what I'm finding, guys. These are from special ed teachers. Here's the, the truth is 30 years ago or so when I graduated, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to do anything with special ed. And guess what? We're all special ed teachers now. All of us. All of us. We have special needs in every classroom and multiple in some. 
So you need to get connected with special ed teachers in your area and get resources from them. They have all sorts of books and, and not, not like published books, but just, uh, what do they call those books? That they, yes, the social stories that help kiddos who are on the spectrum or whatever have difficulty with their emotions. They create these books all the time and they want to help you. So use them. Um, let's see, I think this one got, I had some other calming cards. Calming cards, um, books that can help them calm, use thermometer, anything. Anything you can get your, anybody heard of Tuck? Tuck? Yeah, this is a good one. And you can help them. These all, often they have to do with anger, right? But, because um, that seems to be the most obvious thing. But we also need to teach our kids calming when they're just darn sad and how do we move on? Right? So we have to give them opportunities to calm their body down. I'm going to show you a picture in a little bit of another chart that's on my um, wall. But it, and maybe it's not just a picture. Maybe it's um, a calming, anybody have a calming basket in their room? So some kids need more than just something to look at. They need a little soft toy. I, had, I have a little box and it has soft toys, fidget toys, books about feelings. And if somebody just can't get it together, they know they can go there. And that's where they can calm themselves, self-regulate, calm themselves down. Because I'll tell you what, there are some of those you just can't even get to the strategies until those tears stop, right? So that, that has to be a part of our, our learning. Oh, and the breathing. Anybody have the breathing ball? Okay, and there are all sorts of, let's do something right now. Okay, so what I like to do if we're lining up and Jim is happening, pull, put a piece, pull a piece of bubble gum out of, your, out of your pocket. Do it with me. Come on, your teachers. You got to wake up. Pull a piece of bubble gum out. What color is yours? Mine is pink. What color is yours? Purple. Oh, my favorite. What? Blue. What color is yours? Pink. Okay, unwrap your bubble gum. Put it in your mouth. Mmm. Oh, so good. I know we're not supposed to have gum at school, but all right, just this once. Chew it, chew it, chew it, chew it, chew it. Now we're going to blow this bubble gum so big. So take a deep breath with me. Ooh, your bubble's growing. Minus two. Do it again. Deep breath, slow. Hold it. My bubble's growing. Is yours? Yeah. Take one more deep. Let's go pop. Oh my gosh. Pick that bubble off. Pick all that bubble gum off. Oh my gosh, it's my ear. But you have just taken three deep breaths. And all we did, it took what? 10 seconds. We put the bubble gum back. They're calmed down. We're ready to go back to class. Just, and that, that's not even because we're upset. Just means because, you know, gym teacher got us all hyper. We'll teach them to calm down. Once you have these four foundational um, aspects in place, these building blocks, you are ready to teach problem solving. Any questions so far? I feel like I've been just talking at you. Okay. I know it seems very elementary, but golly, we can't skip steps. Just as I tutor kids in math, you have to get this building block before you go on to the next step. So let's review till you get it. We got to have these things in steps or the, the next part won't make sense. All right, so let's talk about problem solving. I know this seems pretty elementary, but we need to remember that problem solving is a process. Okay, it is not a unit. It is not a program. It is not a theme. It is ongoing. And it's going to take all year and the next and the next, right? These are, these are skills we're going to have for life. It's the process of working through the details of a problem, obviously, to reach a solution. A problem, and there's our problem on the right, a matter of situations unwelcome or hard to deal with. So here we have two little girls, two girls, one Cinderella costume. Pretty common. Some schools, some licensors will tell you, you need to have five of those to avoid this problem. However, that is not the real world, okay? Our young'uns are growing up and they have been, <laughs> we have lawnmower moms already taking out the problems ahead, right? 
to give our kiddo a smooth ride. You've heard of the lawnmower? Those are the helicopters, mom, moms who have landed and have, and have picked up a snowblower or a helicopter and they've decided to not just hover, but go ahead and make the way clear. That's what we're doing when we take problems out of the classroom and when we only put the red bikes out. That's not the real world and they're going to go to college and they're not going to know how to negotiate and work this out and deal in love with each other. Okay, so here we go. We got two girls, one, and what, what's our temptation when we see this? What would we like to say to them? Take it away. Yeah, take it away. What else could we do? Who had a first, right? But we want to equip these little girls to find a solution to this problem. The solution is someone does get a chance. We don't have to take it away. We really don't. This little girl is found a solution. She's wearing it. What's this one holding? A timer. A timer. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So you tell me right now for a f just a few minutes. I was going to have you turn and talk, but there's, we're a small enough group. Well, how do you right now deal with social problems in your classroom? What are some of your common <laughs> methods? What are you using so far? Good. You say, talk it, work it out. Good. Okay. Go talk about it, figure it out, come and talk to me. What else? Yeah. Mine are younger, so we sit down and help them, like facilitate the conversation of taking turns and can I have it when you're done? Good. That's great. Good. Ooh. Good. Like that. What else? Anything else? Any other brave? Yeah, we use our field statements at my school. Good. So, um, and I hear that you're saying statements as well. So yes. both kids will sit down and have the conversations because that's what's over all the truth. Mm-hmm. And they'll both have, each have an opportunity to talk. And they'll say, well, I feel like you're, I feel this way when you're saying this or that way. And mm -hmm. this is what I'm hearing you saying. So I always Ooh. Think what level is that? Uh, I teach fourth grade. I love that. So yeah. I make my students repeat what the other student had just said and say, well, this is what I hear. Yes. So yeah. Not, so they can, both students can understand the missing link. Mm hmm Understanding because if I'm having a conversation or they're having a conversation between one another, yeah. and one of them says, this is what I hear you're saying, and it's completely off of what the kid just said. Yeah. Well, that's not what I mean. Right. Yeah. Misunderstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Someone else had. To. Well, I just I use a lot of visuals, so I'll mm -hmm. let them pick. Like, you know, do you want to? Can we make a plan for you to use this together, or would you like to trade, or do we want to get the right? Awesome. That's great. That's great. So I'm hearing some of these strategies already in place. When I was a young mom and I hated conflict. And now, granted, when you're in the home, it's different than the classroom, right? <laughs> and I hated it so much, but I would be like, just go work it out. I was, I was essentially saying, fix my car with no tools. When we say, go figure it out, and then come back and talk to me, or, I mean, now that's a good strategy. That, that come back, there is a point and a place, we'll talk about that, when you say, come back and talk with me, come and get a teacher. But to just, when we just send them out, it's, we're, we're saying fix my car with no skills, tool, tools, or knowledge. We have a little bit, though, right? We do it a little bit. I mean, my husband knows a little bit about fixing cars. He actually knows a lot about fixing cars. He also knows where to order the parts. That's another skill. Now that part came, will he really be able to fix my Turing? That's a question that remains to be seen. It's going to take him maybe some practice, and that's where the skills come in. Okay, so I love this. I found this. If a child doesn't know how to read, what do we do? Teach them to read. If a child doesn't know how to swim, we teach them. They don't know multiplication, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to drive, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to behave, behavior, we often get frustrated, scold, or even punish. And I'm talking to parents, teachers, right? It is, this takes a little energy and planning. It does. 
And can I just say, way more important, especially early elementary or early childhood, than teaching ABCs. I'll say more about that in a little bit. That's important, not to put that aside. So what I used to do is just put a lot of charts on the wall, right? And, and I'd maybe point to them, but we weren't really picking them apart. So there are all sorts of charts you can put on the wall, expecting kids to know what to do with them. But remember, a lot of these littles are non-readers. That's a lot of symbols up there that they don't even know. Of course, they have cute pictures, but without the teaching and the practicing, that's just another thing on the wall to them. So a, one of the best tools I've come across, and where we're really going to focus a good chunk of our time this morning, is this set of tools. They are from the Center on the Social Emotional Foundations for Early Learning. It's in the handout when you get to the links. Center on the Social Emotional Foundations for Early Learning, and it includes many, 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 many resources, including solution kits. So I'll just tell you, the solution kit is just that. All the solutions that you, some of you already suggested that we can offer kiddos, especially the youngers, and they, on this uh, website, they have all sizes. So you could obviously blow these up too. So we have these everywhere. I should say I have these everywhere in my classroom. Um, these are the solutions we want to, these are the tools we want to teach the kids. We're putting these tools in their tool belt. And here's how I taught this. So in small groups, I would say is the best, although I have done it in larger groups. You just start introducing them in um, maybe five or six kids. And you're going to go through, first of all, what problems are. You're going to define the word problem. They get that. If they can say Tyrannosaurus, they can say problem, right? And what a solution is. We have a problem on this page. What is the problem? So have, help them work through what the problem is. They're looking. What do you notice? This girl has balloons. This, the boy doesn't. What do you think the boy wants? He doesn't have a balloon. So what's the problem? He wants a balloon. What could they say? He could say to her. She could ask nicely. I know this seems so elementary, but they don't understand. They've got options because they're just used to hearing who had it first, give it back, that kind of thing at home, right? And there's about nine of them, I want to say. Here's one. What's the problem? He's being a pest. She can walk away and ignore. You have that power. Walk away, sister. He's pulling your hair? Tell him to please stop. <laughs> you have power. You can walk away and ignore that. That is an option. So I go through each one. Two kids, one ball. You can play together. As I'm introducing these, I might have a toy right there. And we'll practice then. We will role play. Here is the, I'm looking for a toy. No toys in second grade, I guess. No, <laughs> I'm sure if I looked hard enough. And I will ha have the two kids sitting there and say the words. May I please have a turn? Have them practice. Give them the actual skills. You have the tools, you have the knowledge. Now let's practice in a small group setting when there's no emotions involved yet, right? When we're doing pretending, we're pretending a problem, there's not the emotional thing. And that's better to practice so that when the emotions come and we've calmed down, now we know what to do. This one happens all the time, usually with blocks. But in our area, I come from Pensacola, Florida. It happens probably more than in your area. But, you know, they're building, they're doing something. Someone's about to come over. It is okay to say, please stop. Do not, do not step on. They know. They learn to read faces. Don't do it. That's an option. Um, so I have these laminated and on my wall. I also have them on a ring. We go through each one. Here's one just saying, please, this is asking for help. I have a problem. My shoelace is untied. I have kids who do not know how to ask for help. They might demand it. They might cry. 
we need to give them the words. Okay? You have elementary kids who don't know how to sometimes ask for help. My daughter teaches in a charter school in New Bedford, Massachusetts. There's a language barrier there. Portuguese. She knows a little Spanish. Sometimes it translates, right? Yeah. Yeah, but not always. And it was a long time ago that she took high school Spanish. So um, they don't know how to ask for help. So she's having to give them words to ask for help. I love the trading option. They don't think of that on their own usually. That's not innate. Yes, ma'am. What you say about giving them the words, mm -hmm. sometimes it's not even the language. It's that they haven't had it. They don't know how to ask. Yes. I teach yeah. middle schoolers, and sometimes I see kids just sitting there, and they're supposed to cut or glue or do something. I say, why aren't you doing the work? I don't have scissors. They say, yeah. what do you need yes. if you don't have scissors? And what level and is that? It doesn't say anything. Yeah. And I say, yeah. if can you see my podium? I have a lot of scissors. Yeah. You to ask me, you ask me you for a scissors. Get one. Yeah. And just sit there and I yeah. say, can you say, could you please let yeah. me scissors? Yeah. Like, oh. Say, say, okay. Go. So why do we why do we do that as adults? I, I know adults who don't ask for help. Why do we not ask for help? Scared to. Scared to? Why else? Shame. Shame. Sign of weakness. Yes. I was with a young adult recently who asked for something and then quickly verbalized to me, oh, I wish I had not ordered that. And I said, you know, you can change, you can change your order. They don't care. And it was like, oh, <laughs> I'm, t I'm talking to 20, 20, early 20 something. Like you can do that. That's an option. Empowering is what we're doing. Empowering them to use their voice. Okay, so trading. And obviously waiting your turn. They learn this, but they also need to know that sometimes that is all you can do. You just can't all be on the slide. And I'll tell them that. Can you all fit on the slide at the same time? Okay, when they make their little trains, but you cannot go side by, it's not going to work. So sometimes you do just have to wait. You know, that's just life. Um, where's my timer? And then there's a picture. I must have lost it. There's another one. Um, get the timer. That is my by far favorite tool to use in the classroom. So these are posted on my wall. They're taught in small groups and then I hang this little beauty on the wall. I think I have a picture of it. Yeah, right there. So this is another calming strategy. Hand on your tummy, count to three, whatever you use. And then this is there for them to take for us to refer to. In fact, I have the tiniest little set on my work keys, which is why I wore it today. You can see how worn and ear dog they are. This baby goes with me everywhere in the bathroom, outside, wherever problems exist, which is everywhere. I have two little boys who just fight every day, and it is February, they're still doing it, to be the first in the bathroom and out of the bathroom. So the battle begins. The battle begins right, right about three feet from the door when they race, and then it happens again at the sink, and then it happens again when they come back out of the bathroom and line up. Every day, every day. So you just, it, yeah, also requires a lot of patience. So we, we, I teach that in small groups. We might do that for a whole week just because there's a lot of them. That's a lot of choices. So we go through it. We role play it together. We have fun. So we're going to do a little role playing here. I need a couple people. Boy, now I really need to find a toy. Uh, maybe you're going to fight over a marker. I need a couple volunteers. Who wants to come up and fight for me? Come on. Couple volunteers, come on. So, oh, we have sisters. Okay, we have one marker. This is your, this is your favorite. You can come up with your own battle about this, but let's just use that object. Okay, you two, start to quarrel and make it, make it loud and frustrating. I want the 
marker. You can have it. But, but, I, but I want it. Oh, girls, girls. Wow, I hear some loud voices over here. Let's just take a deep breath. Calm down. I wish it was that easy. <laughs> so we, we acknowledge the battle, okay? Calm down. That might take a little while, okay? Really? Take a deep breath, girls. And, and then I might say... I might say, look at, look at, look at her face. Let's, you know, you, you just made her really, you might, or I might, I might not point it out, but I might say, is that, a, are you being kind? Are we being helpful right now? Are we being safe? So you reminded them of what they already know, okay? And then we're going to look at what are our options, okay? We have, we have a problem. I see you have a problem, and I know you're sad, and you're sad. Okay, she bought my glasses. And then I... If there's, you know, you have eight or nine on your thing, you're going to only guide them to look maybe at two or three. If they're little olders, they're going to be able to handle nine options. Littles, the smaller they are, you want to kind of narrow the, down the choices. So let's see what we have, you know. Do you remember this? Can you ask nicely maybe? Do you have something you could trade? Maybe she has a color you could use? What do you think? Or maybe we're going to have to wait and take turns. What do you think you want to try? Could I have the marker, please? You can have it when I'm done. Ooh, that's a great answer. You found a good solution. Can you live with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Give them a hand, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you guys. You're good sports. So, <laughs> yeah, and that, like, imagine you're trying to teach. You're in a, maybe you're in a small group or you're in a large group. Or your, I mean, it's not always that easy to interrupt everything you're doing to go over there and help them manage. But I'm telling you, it goes a long, long way. And once they have that skill set and that toolbox, it becomes faster because they remember what the solutions are. They've been posted, you've been talking about them, and you are filling them up with all sorts of good options. So a couple of helpful hints as you're doing this. Do give the kids time to try. Maybe you don't even have to suggest solutions. Give them a chance to work it out without just saying, work it out, right? Give them the specific verbiage. Give them a chance. If they can't, then offer suggestions. Ask questions. Not like just who had it first, but you know, try to lead them to the solution. Have you thought of something else? And then reinforce this behavior, you guys. When you see them doing the right thing, do some something. Maybe you're going to take a picture. Maybe you're going to start a kindness jar because they worked it out and you're going to put a, something in that kindness jar or whatever reward. Maybe a pizza party if it's older kids or something that they're earning, they're, you're reinforcing that positive behavior. Um, maybe it's just uh, to talk about it at the end of the day. You're going to, I told you we'd take pictures, right? If you have the technology, I don't now in my school, but in my last school, I would capture those pictures on the playground and I could get them right on the iPad and then during closing circle. You know what I loved about today? I saw my two friends fighting over a ball and they figured it out, right? Or I might say, how were you kind today? How did you solve a problem today? And then they share a scenario and did you say thank you to your friend who shared? Oh, thank you. And by the end of the day, they're affirming each other. Or by the end of the year, you can be saying, who did you see working out a problem today? Or did someone help you share uh, whatever? And make sure to thank them right then. Thank them. Thank you. They're affirming each other. Yes, sir. And I look for moments like in the high school days that I see kids doing stuff not even in my classrooms, but then send their parents an email saying, Oh, hey, that's so nice. So son or daughter do this today. Just wanted you to know. Yeah. That's great. Oh, that is so good. And I need to remember that. We use Bright Wheel this year. Uh, any of you use the Bright Wheel app? Yeah, the Bright Wheel app is a great way of capturing moments, sending them to the pic pictures in the moment. That would, that's a great idea. Thank you for that. Um, I'm usually showing progress in other ways, but I love that. Yeah.
let the parents know. I did have a conference with a parent this year, and she came to me because she and her daughter and the daughter's cousin are in my class. They fight like cats and dogs, apparently, outside of school. So I showed her the solution kit and sent it to her so she could use the same verbiage at home that I'm using at school. Eventually then, they are doing this all on their own. Seriously, four-year-olds, at the end of the year, they are grabbing the, um, the solutions off and bringing it over. What are we going to do? And they'll look through the pictures. There is the final one that I always teach them last is to get a teacher because there are some times they just need that adult support. And they know they can always come to me, right? But I do try to get them to work it out by themselves first after they've been taught. This is a picture of my old friend Lucas. This was at my last school. And um, he needed a little support to write his name, but this is our, our using a timer system. So they have to, it's a sign-up list. I'm sure you all do that. It's the sign-up list. There's the timers. If you don't have timers in your early childhood classroom, please get timers. If you're an administrator, get timers. I don't, if you're a principal, get timers for all your classroom. They just take so much of the work out of it. They make their own waiting list. Right now, the kids are just learning the timer. <laughs> and they don't understand that if no one is in the sensory box, you don't need the timer. Just go. <laughs> it's so cute. They love writing their names so much, which I'm thrilled about. But I'm like, dude, it's not a problem. Just go. The timer is when there's a line, you know, and because only two can play. So it's really fun. Yeah, I, it does work. So... Think about this, you guys. This is my whole whiteboard. I won't write on it. Um, what life skills, I was going to brainstorm. I'll make a list on paper. What life skills are kids learning when we teach them using these strategies? What, life, what, what skills will go with them all through adulthood if we can implement this? Yeah. Compromise. Yes, good. Good, yeah. Negotiation. Negotiation, yes. Patience. Patience, good. Who said failure? Yeah. Yes, good, thank you. And just, yeah, I think that, whoa, that not getting what you want. <laughs> Yeah, delayed gratification, excellent. How about personal space? Boundaries, Boundaries good. Manners. manners. They, they got some good manners in the South, right? Trina? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. They are so, now our school is full of Northerners. <laughs> right now. But if you go to the local school where I sub, they are they are yes ma'am, right? They still yes ma'am, no ma'am. And I've heard parents when I tutor, I'm not from the south, so it's hard to have it for me. They will correct their kids. It is there's a lot of that happening, but I would say not so much in the public school, mostly in the parochial schools down south. They're still yes ma'am. Manners, self-control, right? Listening, it takes a lot to listen when there's a hot emotions and they want what they want. And when you want what they want, right? There, this entitlement we have, um, it, it follows them if we're not teaching this, right? They are going to go into their adulthood with that feeling of I can... And I don't want to blame everything on COVID, but I'll blame some of this on when they were home, they didn't have to, the, the rules were loosey, uh, goosey. Kids um, weren't always asked to sit down and eat a meal. They were running around with food because some young adults do that. And so it was easier sometimes to just have food in front of the television. So then they come, started school and they'd never eaten a snack at a table. And, you know, moms and dads don't always have the skills to, you know, the, the parenting opportunities since COVID have been 
huge, huge, huge. Lots and lots of life skills. I actually prepared this talk with another colleague when I taught public 4K in Wisconsin. And she had a really cool method of teaching these life skills, including all the problem solving that we talked about. Instead of doing a week of pumpkins, like we do, or fall, or whatever, she would add one of these characteristics to her monthly calendar. So she did those, what you mentioned, empathy, compassion, in a four-year-old room. And there are resources out there to teach some of this. So one of them is patience. And so I have a little activity to wake us up in this warm room. Let's see if I can find it. Um, there are Sesame Street, if you can believe it. If you Google the PBS, Sesame Street has a lot of all those great life skill words we talked about. They, they are a great resource. But here's one video she shared about um, teaching patients to, and I'll see if this works. Stand up with me. Let's see if this works. Are you familiar with these guys? Okay, I'm not hearing it, though. Are you hearing it? Oh, rats. Oh, there we go. Stand up, guys. I don't know where their volume is. Be awesome. Oh, let's be awesome. Hey. <laughs> awesome. It's teaching. What can we do when we're waiting? Tap in our foot. Let's be awesome. Oh, let's be awesome. Crazy awesome. Let's be awesome. Ho, oh, let's be awesome. Let's be awesome. Now we're going to do some head stuff. Awesome. <laughs> Let's be awesome. It is patient. Can you imagine a small child doing this? But when they're cool guys doing it, they'll do it. Let's be awesome. Oh. Let's be awesome. My torso is patient. Let's be awesome. Thank you, guys. You can have a seat. Give yourselves a hand. <sighs> All right. All right. Hold on. I am going to take us back. So, she would choose a life skill that her class, after listening, learning, and hearing, what does this class need to learn? Because you know every year they're different. You might have a, oh boy, my co-teacher right now next door. 
Her skills are totally different. What they're working on, they're working on blurting. Blurting is their problem. So, she, you know, I would be finding resources on controlling the blurting. <laughs> um, look for resources, find the scenarios, practice, 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 role playing, teach the skills in different ways every day for the whole week. That's what my friend used to do um, in her classroom, and that's where I found that video. All right. I hope that I have shown today that a problem is not negative. At least, thank you God that I finally learned that. <laughs> but it's an opportunity for growth. But it is our responsibility to give the kids the knowledge, tools, and opportunities to practice the skills, right? And not always in the heat of the moment, but then when we have those opportunities that we stop what we're doing and take the time to meet those emotional, and that might mean getting up, walking over, sitting down with them, working it out, right? Okay, any questions? Any comments? Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's good. You know, yeah. True, true. I think having that discussion, having that talk again, um, I, I will say that I have actually brought it around, try to look for it as an opportunity to um, what you've already talked about with forgiveness. I'm sure that if you're talking about it, you've taught it. And so just connecting all those, helping them connect those dots. See, this is a time when we forgive, like, you know, help them connect the dots. We had a conflict not, not long ago that happened on the playground. And guess what? That problem didn't get solved on the playground. Not as near as quick. So sometimes it does take time. It also is okay to let them have the time they need to um, go through that because like when we have arguments are we always ready to forgive right away yeah right so time is a big part of it and helping them connect the dots anyone else want to speak into that good Good. So yeah, there are a handful of situations where it does last several days for the ladies. Willing to hold a grudge, but that also allows you to have the conversation of what is a grudge, what does it look like? Yeah. Did Jesus ever hold a grudge for what he did and have that conversation as well, which has been really great to have that question as well. Oh, yeah. That's silent treatment. My gosh, you guys, I see that even in four-year-old preschool. And, and then I learned, I learned from them. Sometimes they weren't just, it wasn't that they weren't ready to forgive, they just needed time. So now I know to ask, especially a couple of cousins, <laughs> do you just need some time to think about this? Yeah, I just, I, I need some space. And, and even they need a little bit of whatever. But there was something, I just, it was a beautiful moment. The four-year-old boy, a couple of boys who are good friends, they were just a little bit too much together that day, I think. And by the end, they had a conflict. And it, one was clearly not speaking to the other, and it affected everyone. Everyone could see how this one was just not going to let go. And they were mad. They were really mad, visibly mad at each other all through lunch. We got about an hour left. We're set, and somehow, they fixed it. They got it. And the whole class breathed a sigh of relief. So at closing circle, we talked about it. Look, they're friends again. They're sitting by each other, you know, and they were all like, yeah, they were cheering them on to work it out because they like harmony in the classroom as much as this peacemaker. They find that it feels better for everyone instead of staying mad. Other questions, comments? Yeah. So for our Sunday school classes, we see these students once a week for an hour. Yeah. How would you change implementing all these to be overwhelming? Yeah, I right. I would incorporate maybe um, my first just off the top of my head, a couple of them, 
in with your studies or as you're you know teaching them the lesson bring in that verbiage if are they doing a lot of conflicts within Sunday school in the hour is are, are I'm asking are there yeah yeah so that's that's huge I I didn't say this because I forgot when we started the VP, the 4K, okay, you know how it's happening all over the country. It's, we're past that even. They're bringing in public 4K, right? And so that happened in our district in West Bend, Wisconsin. Uh, 4K wanted to begin. We decided in that, our church prayed about it. We decided to partner. When they began, I was in on the beginning of it. When they began, they interviewed all the kindergarten teachers and said, what do you want the four-year-olds to know? Right? Yes, we want to know how should we prepare the fours. It's there they called it 4K, four-year-old kinder, four kindergarten. So it was a little more educational structure. But they said, what do you want to know? And they said, all we want them to know is how to work out problems. Great if they know some letters. Great if they can write their name. But we can't get anything done because we are spending all our time working. They don't know how to get along at all. Please teach them social skills. Social skills, social skills. So yeah, um, and of course, we want to also incorporate our biblical um, teachings. And guess what? What verses do all of this uh, feed into? What, what are the conflict resolution verses that I talked about without bringing up any scripture today? Do you know off the top of your head? Matthew 18 and somebody else said it. Five. Five. Yeah. We are we are Matthew 18ing here. We are saying if you have a problem, go go to the person. Now that's a sin, I know. Well, they could have sinned against you. You go, you talk to them, right? And then you um, and Matthew 5 is a little more if someone's offended you. Jesus says, go and work that up. Don't you bring my, your offering to me yet? Like, you've got unsolved issues here. How many of you have unresolved issues with an adult right now in your life? Wow, I'm the only one? <laughs> unresolved issues. Somebody who you have either angered in the past or you have angered, and they've maybe moved on from your life, but that was never really resolved. It happens all the time. It happened to me a year ago with a parent that I was tutoring. I didn't handle it very well, I'll admit. She was cray cray. And I am sad over that because I did not resolve that with her the way I should have. And I've just, as the Lord has brought it on my heart a couple times since then, I've just prayed that I will bump into her in the, uh, something. I would like to resolve that. That's un, it's unrest for me. I don't have peace about that because it didn't end well. We want, these, we want the kids to feel that peace. And that's what Jesus was saying. Don't come and offer me your offering until you get this worked out. Work it out. And he doesn't just say work it out. He says, I give you the tools. I set the example. And that would be another thing I would say is make sure you're emulating this in your classroom and modeling this in your school with your coworkers. It is so easy to just, okay, walk away. There are times we have to do that, and there are other times to do the big girl thing. Put your big girl pants on, as my little sister likes to say, big boy pants on, and say, I am sorry. I realize I maybe said that, and it was harsh, and or whatever. Or the worst one is harder for me. That offended me, right? I, I need to hear what you meant by that. And, and get that stuff. Don't let those the enemy get a foothold. Because you know you're doing good things. You're doing the work for the Lord. And he doesn't like it. And so he's going to use your relationships. But if you have a stressful something with your assistant, guess what? They pick up on that. So I'm not saying you got to work out all your problems in front of the kids. But you could model some of that kindness you could use when you're thinking it say it out loud thank you so much for that help or whatever make sure you're modeling it other comments questions before i hand out one more yes um, i teach a 435 class, and my kids are always so and so did this and so and so did this mm -hmm. and so they always hear all right you know yep 
your friend would like to talk to you, come over here please. And so they come over and I'm like, okay, first you need to tell them what happened that you didn't like. Yes. And so they're very, I didn't like it when, and then the other friend's like, sorry. And I was like, no. <gasps> wow, yeah. I'm sorry for what? What yes. are you sorry about? Good. Are you sorry you got in trouble? Mm -hmm. Are you sorry I had to make you hike it across the playground? What are you sorry about? Yeah. I'm sorry that I pushed you down. I'm mm -hmm. sorry that I, you know, like, you need to be able to tell them what you're sorry for. That's good. Being really specific about it. Yeah. Be beware how with the um, the goal isn't always just to get the apology. And this is where I was raised to just if you're in trouble, you did something, you say I'm sorry. And how many times did I say to my kids, say you're sorry, and that was it. So I'm glad you're bringing more into it. But I, we want them to find that conviction on their on their own eventually, without us always prompting. The I'm sorry. The I'm sorry. When we when we do it so fast, it it just becomes meaningless and rote. Would you? I'm seeing a lot of nodding. Um, so that's great. Yep. Bring up the feelings. Bring up the specifics. And what could you do next time? Is usually what I follow that up with. Yep. So what are you gonna do next time? I this one thing I did get right with my kids. <laughs> Sometimes we would even just role play a correct. Let's try that again. Let's, and I would call it, let's rewind, rewind. Those, I, mm, those words weren't quite, let's rewind and let's try that again. And so my, my youngins did learn that a little bit. And um, they're not the monsters that I, like I said, three of them are teachers and they're great kids. So I want to point out a couple things on the handout before I let you go. Um, a lot of what I have learned about classroom management, I learned from the pyramid model. If you ever hear training of that in your area, it is excellent. It, it, there's a lot of what I believe and do in classroom management that works. This is your big, this, this link right here, which still works, because I just went to it recently. Circle that one on your handout. That's where you're going to find the problem solving kit. You're going to have to go down, 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 down on that opening page to social social emotional and then look 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 for problem solving kits and they have different sizes they have all the different the big ones the medium sized ones the tiny little ones that you can hang on your lanyard circle and star that and then there are just a few other links yeah they're free i love free free is so awesome there's some calming um ideas there there's our song we did um, yeah, this Cookie Monster one is really cute too. Me want it, but me wait. Um, and of course your books. I didn't even talk about books, teaching. Okay, couple things I need from you guys. You may, you may go whenever you're ready, but we have 15 minutes. If you are willing to stay, I have a quick brief, 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 couple question questionnaire. I don't really care how you feel about me, but I'm revamping my website and I need a couple quotes. So that is one, I do care how you feel about me. I'm sorry, I do care. Um, but the backside is more important to me. And let me tell you why. Do you know that 300,000 educators have walked out of the classroom since 2020? 300,000. Do you know that education is the number one profession for burnout? above medical now, my heart is breaking for our schools and our as public and parochial and for teachers. So um, I had a little friend of mine say to me, and it struck a lightning bolt in my heart, this phrase, on January the 4th, first day back from break, a little girl while playing with Plato said to me, Miss Huseman, or she calls me Miss Gretchen, Miss Gretchen, it's a good day to be a teacher. And I'm like, four, what did you say? She said, it's a good day to be a teacher. I was not feeling it, okay? I just wanted more coffee and I'd just come off break. My four kids were home and they got along pretty well. Just, and um, I had to dig deep to agree with her. It did not feel like a good day. When my two, two of my kids got back to their schools after break, one principal quit after Christmas break, so she arrived back, principal's gone. Um, number, bo number three kid who teaches music at a Lutheran school, his teacher, his principal was fired 
over Christmas break, and his only friend in the school quit. So I couldn't, I just found that out. I could not, but I dug deep, and I worked on an article, got some research, and I have starting to try to find, I have 25 now, I've been putting this out on social media, why is it a good day to be a teacher? I have 25, I'm looking for 50, I'm gonna, I want this, I, we need to encourage each other. My youngest daughter said I can't watch TikTok anymore because all the videos are about, hey, I quit, the, I quit the classroom and I'm happier than ever. She said, I'm just starting. I can't watch that stuff. We need something positive. So I'd like to know why you think it's a good day to be a teacher. And if you're willing for me to put that out on social media, tell me your name and where you teach what you teach. Um, and then there's just a couple other questions here. Um, <laughs> if you're willing to fill them out. One of them is, I'd like to know what you want to hear from best practices. There's not a lot for education this week. So that's why I wanted to offer this and if there are other topics. So if you're willing to fill this out, in the meantime, I also want to tell you about a free link on my website. There is a, I wrote years ago, um, a prayer uh, tool for, uh, I guess it'd be for your administrators, um, teaching your teams to pray aloud for your schools doesn't happen in all Lutheran schools like we'd like to assume. So that's there. And I have a couple other free gifts that I'm going to give to random people if you're willing to fill this out. So thank you for staying. Please share your heart. If you want to connect with me, I have, oh, sorry. I have a whole bunch of links on um, social media. Would you guys just pass those down? Um, and I would love to connect with you. I, I just, educators are near and dear to my heart. Always will be. So if you don't mind filling that out. Thank you. Thank you for staying. Thank you for coming. Want one? Thank you. I want to know who's left. Who lives the farthest? Oh, this could be tricky. North. Who came from? Anybody from Canada? Did I run out? Did I literally run out by one? <laughs> oh no, they're there, there. Did anybody come from Canada? Did anyone come from northern uh, Minnesota? No, southern Minnesota? Any Twin Cities? Anybody farther north than the Twin Cities? Okay. Well, golly, now we gotta. So I want to give these away. Um, let's give your team at least one. You get a big one. Yeah. You all all together? All right, we'll give you two. Thank you. Um, how many of you have, who has five or more special needs kids in your classroom? My, yeah. But you know what I mean. Four? Four? Girl, you go to that link. Anybody else have more than four? You, here. Thank you. And you guys. You could if you want to. My email. It, it's up to you. If you, want, if you want to stay, we have like 10 minutes. If you don't, um, my email is on my card. Gretchen.Husman at gmail.com. You can send it to me. Um, you can follow me on facial, social media. Send me a message. Okay, I got two more. Let's see. Who wants a kit? I want. Thank you. You know what I'm going to give you? You're welcome. I'm going to give you these. Take them home. Cut them out. Laminate them. Okay. Yeah. The other thing I should have mentioned when you all were here before is I would love to come to your schools and teach this to your staff if you want something like that. I've taught this at early childhood conferences, so remember my name there. Um, I, this, these are life, like I said, I, I just, they're lifelong skills we can teach our kids. And it seems intuitive, but it's, it's not always as intuitive. It's got to be intentional, not just intuitive. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And please go on the website, find the Teacher's Prayer Companion. That you can download for free, teaching teachers to pray aloud for your school.